a special speaker. This is Terry Kelly, who won the Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences Department Alumni Award. The alumni Award we only give it out. This is only the third time we've given this award out. But we give it to our special alumni who have achieved great things in their careers. Uh, back when Terry was a student here uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, we were the meteorology department. Now we're the atmospheric and oceanic science department. Basically, it's a name change, a little additional uh, things that we do. But um, back in those days, we were the meteorology department. In 1971, Terry graduated from our department. Uh, as you may know, our department is a uh, leader in various kinds of technologies for weather, including weather display technology, satellite technology. We're the home of satellite meteorology. And uh, Terry, as a part of this department, uh, became familiar with some of the display technology we uh, developed. And uh, he took it from there out of the private industry. And the rest has been history. He's pretty much used the technology. It's the Wisconsin idea, right? Mm -hmm. he, he, he took the technology from Wisconsin and he took it out in the world and he changed the world in a big way for not just people in the United States, but people all over the world. Uh, just to give you a few of his accolades, he's a fellow of the American Meteorological Society. He received an award for outstanding achievement <laughs> by broadcast meteorologists from the American Meteorological He's a member of the Wisconsin Broadcasters Association Hall of Fame. He's an earnest and young entrepreneur of the year in Wisconsin. <coughs> he and his wife Mary here um, the philanthropist of the year of, uh, you know, in the Wisconsin area. He founded five companies, including Weather Central, and many of you don't realize he founded the Rhythm, Rhythm and Blooms celebration. I took my kids there for years. And uh, I yeah, thank you for that. I mean, that's, that was one of the neatest things about Madison, was Rhythm and Blooms. And, uh, and, and they still remember that. So thank you very much for that. So without further ado, here's Eric. Okay, hopefully my mic's on. Can you hear me okay? Um, I want to thank Dr. Tripoli and it's not on. More volume? I didn't switch it. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. We'll try again. All right, how's that? Can you hear me now? Yay. Um, in addition to Dr. Tripoli, there are other members of the department here and other members, yesterday I had a chance to meet with graduate students and professors at the Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, I'm sorry, the AOS department. Um, and uh, it's great to see all the young minds in new directions that are going on and know that uh, many of the advances that uh, we had a small hand in starting with um, began to make a difference. We need our IT help. Um, I also would point out to you in the audience tonight, we have at least two-thirds of the broadcast meteorologists who you hear every night on the air. We've got Gary Canali here from Channel 3, and Bob Lindmeyer uh, from Channel 27 here. Bob, you go back to 80, is that when I heard you, 82? 1980. 80? Yeah. Okay. Long time. And my dear friend Ken Rizzo, who ran the National Weather Service in the state until his retirement recently, and who was a buddy in crime because we both graduated in 1971 in meteorology. Um, there are many other distinguished guests, too, uh, like Senator Mark Miller here uh, from the Wisconsin State Senate, who's done many wonderful things and is a strong environmental supporter. We're very proud of him and his work. Um, we have John Nice, who heads up Venture Investors of Wisconsin, who's made a big difference in entrepreneurs' lives for many, many years here in the state, very successfully. We've got Dave Erickson, who was our first programmer way back when in color graphics, and uh, we're awfully glad to see Dave from time to time. 
And I'm sure I'm missing lots of others of you, but I, I did want to recognize my family too, starting with my wife Mary here. We've been married a very long time. She always says, don't say how many years. <laughs> uh, but decades and decades and decades. And Deb McHugh, my assistant, uh, feels like part of the family. Uh, as Mary puts it, she's my wife at home and Deb's my wife at work. <laughs> so between the two of them, they tell me what to do. And uh, George Arita is here too, who's formed his own venture fund recently. And George has had a lot of success. Um, beyond Mary and all the, I'll talk a little bit more about Mary's influence on my life as I go through this a little bit. But uh, we've got a good part of the rest of our family here, starting with my eldest son, Chris uh, Kelly, who uh, owns and runs a successful software business uh, with many customers in television, so the apple didn't far too, fall from the, too far from the tree. And uh, Dr. Michelle Kelly, who's a pediatric hospitalist at UW Children's Hospital, and two of my wonderful four grandchildren belong to the pair of them. There's Isla Kelly right there and Mr. Liam Kelly. And my youngest son, Michael, who works for Mark Pocan, since Mark was elected here in the Madison office and does a lot of wonderful work uh, working for constituents and getting things done and uh, accompanying Mark on important trips and things like that. So I'm very blessed in my life to be able to enjoy all those great things and the fact that my family all resides mm -hmm. here in Madison. All, all four grandchildren, all three sons. So I think I'm very lucky. I, have, I also want to recognize John Martin and others in the department uh, for their kindness to me over the years and for being here tonight. So I, I've got a two-parter for you. One thing when you're really old and somebody gives you a, a plaque to hang on the wall, um, I cleared this ahead of time, but they said, sure, you can talk about whatever you want. <laughs> so I don't have to stick to a subject, and uh, I'd be happy to take your questions. I intend to keep my remarks to around 45, 50 minutes at the most. Uh, I know you have places to be and people to see, uh, but I'd be happy to take questions afterwards if, if you care to. But I'm going to talk a little bit about, because I thought it might be interesting to you all, the evolution of television weather. Um, I'm unfortunately old enough to remember not quite as far back. I had to go back further than I started just to make myself feel better. <laughs> so the first things you'll see are weathercasts from the 50s, in which I was barely born, thank God. Uh, and then ranging up through the years to some of the things we take for granted today in terms of flying through clouds and color animations of radar and high resolution satellite pictures and the like. So I thought that might be fun the first uh, 15, 10, 15 minutes or so. The rest of my time, I wanted to just talk to you about climate change, and I'm not here to lecture you about the sky falling. Um, quite, you know, it is pretty dire. I think you all know that. Um, and we, as usual, as a human race, have waited way too long. And now we have to really scramble if we're going to save uh, any significant part of what we consider our beautiful environment and our atmosphere uh, in the future. But the message I bring you tonight is actually one of hope in that despite, and I'm sorry, I'm going to be showing my politics a little bit, despite our, uh, our uh, orange-haired president, despite uh, Scotty Walker, despite others who have done their best to try to disavow uh, that there's global warming going on and climate change. Uh, a lot of states have taken the bit between their teeth and are doing a lot of things on their own. Not Wisconsin, but I'll tell you how I think we could get there. I had a chance to meet several times with Governor Evers, and uh, he has a very good team put together uh, thinking about ways to re-accelerate our state to catch up with the Illini, the Hawkeyes, the Wolverines, and the rest of them because they're way ahead of us, not to mention California and other states. So I'm going to talk primarily positively because you're young, you have your whole lives ahead, and uh, I think that if we are determined enough as individuals, we can ask our government, we can ask 
uh, others to take actions which still can be effective in terms of climate change. So <coughs> with that long preview, uh, I'm not getting any Bluetooth response there. Huh? Yeah, you're right. Thanks, Deb. See? Told you I needed Deb. Um, <coughs> and I think I've talked about this slide already. Answers are about climate change. Answers are available and affordable. Most of what I'm going to talk about tonight is already implemented in major ways in other parts of the world. So why can't we do it? Um, and, you know, if we don't address these things now and over the next five to ten years, we're going to be faced with the second to last bullet, which is called geoengineering, which is the last desperate attempt to cool off the earth, which may cost billions or hundreds of billions or a trillion dollars. It could be done, but it's a massive undertaking and has all kinds of issues associated with it. Um, where did I get my interest in science and my interest in exploring new directions? I got it uh, at least partially from my father, um, who in the 1920s and early 30s, do you think, Mary? Mm -hmm. At the 30s? Yeah. Uh, she's my fact checker, so we don't have to read about it online um, as being fake news, right? Uh, but my dad figured out early on that he could write for these uh, pulp magazines, which, as you see at the top here, Adventures of Future Science. There are two here, although he wrote dozens or hundreds of articles, and uh, he was fortunate enough to be in the Science Fiction Hall of Fame. But he showed me early on that, um, you know, things like atomic warfare, things like rocket-based travel, things like black holes, which is what this story was about, um, you know, came out of his imagination. I'm sure other people thought of these things too. But he brought them to life. And I forever take the lesson that um, we can do anything if we can anticipate and have some decent idea of what's going to happen and how we might deal with it. Uh, Dr. Tripoli was very kind to talk about that. In space science, uh, I did work for the Space Science Center after I got my meteorology degree. That's part of the operation over there, for, if any of you don't know. Um, and space science was funded by NASA, but also received other grants, and I'm sure support from the university, too. Is that true, John? Yeah. Or Greg? Yeah. But um, in the days I was there, there was a new computer system running on a DEC PDP-11. How many here have ever heard of a DEC PDP-11? <laughs> All the, only the people with white hair. Everybody has white hair except for this gentleman, who must be really, really smart. Uh, but a digital equipment company was a computer company in that day, out of business long ago. A PDP-11 was a huge computer. It probably filled you know, this whole section of seats. And I remember we were so excited to get a 10 megabyte disk, which filled half the room. 10 megabytes. The stick that you know, I brought to run this program has 64 gigabytes on it, on a little tiny thumb, thumb drive. So, and I'm sure you all know that the power in your cell phone, the computer power and memory is much greater than ran the entire space shuttle, which wasn't that long ago. So we're advancing at an incredible pace and that will continue. And I was privileged to work on uh, the program called IVAM, which is Innovative Video Application to Meteorology. We were starting to see the first satellite images, the first radar images, and people were crying out for help with specific weather needs for forecasting. If you're a, a ski area, you want to know exactly what the temperature, humidity, and wind is going to be because you don't want to make a bunch of snow and have it all melt or blow onto the next hill. If you're a utility, you want to know hour by hour not only the temperature, what it's going to be, but also the humidity, the cloud cover, the wind, because you have to compute your electric load. You don't want to be generating too much electricity because it's 
economically wasteful, and you don't want to be gen generating too little and leave people in the dark. So we knew there were lots of needs that were unfilled, particularly for specific applications for meteorology back then. Um, and one of them was take the groundbreaking satellite imagery that was first being seen at McIdas at the University of Wisconsin and make it available to markets worldwide. And to do that, develop a video system which could be used not only for specialty purposes but also for television, which meant it had to, of course, meet broadcast standards. Um, and the term now casting, I think, was invented at Space Science and the University of Wisconsin. Uh, and it's, it's a wonderful term because it gives you the in intensity of, we want to know what's going on right now. And in the days when I started, the worst forecast for the first 12 hours, because the local sensing capability was not very good. We did better, actually, at 24 and 48 hours. And so we needed to fill in accuracy in the first 12 hours so that we could fulfill all these needs that we knew existed. Um, <coughs> and I think I've talked about this. We needed real-time updates. We needed severe weather alerting. And to do that, we, we had the first navigated satellite imagery. And we took radar and colorized it and animated it uh, down and zoomed in on it to make sure that uh, we could invent things like storm warnings for an individual in a particular location. Is that thunderstorm going to hit my house? Is it going to hit my son's soccer field? Um, and that can be done today. We kind of take it for granted. But that was just light years out of sight back when we started in the 70s. In the early days of television, weather presentation was only electronic in the sense that the television camera was an electronic device. The map images and other visuals used to support the presentation were hard copy materials that were shot with a television camera. The earliest techniques predated the use of chroma key devices, so the support visuals were literally placed on the wall behind the presenter, and then the entire scene was shot with a camera. This scene is the image that was broadcast. These are example weathercasts from the mid to late 1950s. Note the hard wall maps in the absence of electronically generated images. The examples show two different approaches. The first two clips where the information is assembled and prepared on the map in advance, and this third example where the map is actually a chalkboard where the presenter draws information on the map live on air. Here's a temperature plot circa 1955. How many of you have theme music for your weather segment? <laughs> Good old days. The first step toward electronic image sources for television weather were radar displays. The first radars used in television were originally designed as airborne systems. As early as 1959, Roy Lee at WTVP TV in Tampa, Florida, was using one of these units that had been converted for ground based use. The use of overlays allowed for the progressive building up of information to discuss a particular weather situation. A variety of different display mechanisms were employed, from maps that were sequenced on a circular I remember Mike Nelson. window, to the use of a series of weather boards, which could be pulled down within a map frame. <laughs> the amount of manual work that accompanied these kinds of presentations was simply phenomenal. At the end of a busy weather day, not uncommon to find a crew of dead tired forecasters backstage. <laughs> <laughs> As the 60s advanced, the appearance of satellite imagery became more commonplace. Still a hard copy presentation, these images were based on analog satellite data and were monochrome images. In the 70s, interesting developments were occurring outside the broadcast weather presentation arena. A project called MACITIS, which was an acronym for Man Computer Interactive Data Access System, was underway at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. The goal of MACITIS was to electronically display real-time satellite imagery and other current weather data for analysis. Dr. Richard Daly, a co-founder of Color Graphic Systems, was then a member of the MACITIS team and was very involved in MACITIS satellite imaging and graphics display programming. MACITIS was unique in its use of a video display for weather data overlay analysis, and 
and this, along with Dick's involvement, were to have a significant impact on electronic weather graphics a few short years later. Personal computers were just being introduced toward the end of the 1970s, and it was at this time that I began to explore the idea of applying this type of technology to my television weather presentation. I was fortunate to get in contact with Dick Daly, and we began to explore the possibilities that the new personal computer technology could bring to television weather presentation. The first computer we obtained was an Apple II. In the spring of 1979, Dr. Daly began to write the first computer code for what was to become the first color graphics weather system. Our first demonstration videotape, that you're seeing here, was created in May of 1979. Later that year, at the AMS Broadcast Meteorology Conference, I delivered a paper that focused on the future of computer graphics in television weather. I'm certain that my projections at the time underestimated the explosion of interest and development that was about to occur. These first graphic systems still did not provide satellite imagery because of the lack of commercially available satellite images. At the NAD convention in 1981, Color Graphics, in conjunction with a newly formed company called Environmental Satellite Data, showed for the first time what digital color satellite images would look like and announced that our new product, the LiveLine, would be available in a few months' time. LiveLine 3 still retains the honor of being the most popular weather graphic system of all time, with over 250 units installed. The application-specific design not only made the creation and on-air sequencing of an entire show possible, it streamlined this process and allowed the broadcast meteorologist to present a highly sophisticated presentation with a minimum of preparation time. We did other weather-related product development, some of which in retrospect did not turn out to be all that successful for introduction during the Live Life 3 era. Lightning detection and display, which still holds much promise and significance for weather markets, was one of our more interesting adventures. We sold just a few because the price was so prohibitively expensive at that time. But weathercasters and station management took the promotability of this technology to heart. Just look at this promo from the VXIA TV in Atlanta, Georgia, taken from this time period, and you'll see what I mean. Okay, let's dial up our lightning tracker now and take a look at an electric... The man on the left is watching the weather on 11 Alive. The man on the right isn't. That's why the man on the right is about to get the shock of his life. That reminds me of a few classic moments in our my weather broadcasting career. Uh, when I started off um, with the Department of Meteorology, I was privileged to work with many wonderful professors, but Dr. Frank Seacrest, who was uh, taught synoptics and weather forecasting and analysis at that time, set up a little studio on the 14th floor and asked me to help him with some of the first, uh, putting together the first weather casts. And we used to broadcast inside the building. And then WHA got word of it, and they said, why don't you come over here and do a show for us? And so we became part of a show called Target the State, and, uh, which aired on WHA for a number of years. And Frank did the weather on the air, except when he decided he was going to go someplace else or hike through the woods or go up north or whatever, and he said, Terry, you do it. And so that was my first real broadcast television experience. And since I knew it was a university station, I had to dress the part. So I got myself a pipe, and uh, I, uh, I grew a little beard, and I had little leather patches on my elbows, and I'd get on WHA and talk about the weather. And uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, meanwhile, Tom Skilling, whose name you probably recognize, who is been on the air in Chicago now forever. Tom was doing the weather at Channel 27. And in those days, there were only six days a week for news. And the, on Saturday, there was only at 6 o'clock. So he, he got most of the weekend off. But he called me up. He and I knew each other. So he called me up and he said, Terry, 
I haven't had a vacation in three years. I want to go see my brother in Alaska. Why don't you come out and make a videotape? I've seen your work on WHA. Maybe if it's good enough, the manager will let me get away for a couple weeks. So I said, all right. So I go out and I make a videotape. And within days, Skilling gets an offer from Jacksonville, Florida at five times the pay. He didn't have a contract. And he just up and left. They said, you've got to be here Monday because our old guy died. And so uh, next thing I know, I get a call from the general manager, Terry Shockley, who later became my partner in business. And Shockley said, uh, Kelly, he said, he explained the thing with Skilling, and he said, we don't have anybody. And he said, the only tape I have on my desk is yours. And he said, it's terrible. <laughs> It's beyond belief bad. <laughs> but if you could be here at 6 o'clock, we'll give it a try. So that was the, uh, the, the beginning of my television weather career. And the first few weeks, I, uh, I had so much trouble with nervousness that the production manager came up to me and said I was turning green. Not just they didn't have the camera adjusted wrong, I was turning green. And uh, scared to death. And he came up and he said, Terry, what's wrong? I said, well, I'm thinking about those 65,000 people out there all watching. And he said, there aren't 65,000. I said, well, the ratings show that. No, 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 you got it all wrong. He said, when you look in that lens right there, who are you looking at? You're looking at a guy sitting in his shorts, drinking a beer on the couch, and his wife's over there, and she's knitting a sweater, and they're wondering what the weather is going to be to take their kid to school tomorrow or whatever they need to do. That's all. It's just a family. There may be a lot of families, but, and I thought to myself, I can do that. So uh, fortunately for, because he, they, he, they had said to me, you either have to get over this or you have to give this up because <laughs> it was just not working. But that seemed to solve that problem. And uh, ever since then, I've for been fortunate enough to do a lot of public speaking. Um, And you can see how old I am by the back of this. This is the same year that I, I joined WKW in the fall of 1974. This bus is circa 1974. Uh, I'm surprised that it, uh, it doesn't have uh, Fred Flintstone underneath running along to push it. But uh, you can see I came out with Gary Bender did sports and John Lindgren did news. But that, that sure is a long time ago. I've been very fortunate. And I should also point out that Mary, my wife, in so many ways has been such a joy to live with, but one of the great things she did is I would have a lot of trouble moving from one thing to another. I'd be like, I'm at space science. I, I don't want to be a broadcaster. I mean, I'd have to leave my university job. You know, there's security there. You'll be okay. So I did them both for a while. and. Finally, you know, she was very good at telling me, you'll be okay, I'll help you across this ravine or steps in the stream. We'll get to the other side. Be on the lookout for new opportunities, and uh, you'll be fine. So that's one of her, one of many wonderful attributes that she has. We used paper maps in the beginning before we got to computers in 1979. This map you see there is 8.5 by 11, and the way we put these together, state lines were printed, uh, then the colors are put on with what's called a zipatone, which is a plastic stuff you kind of smooth over there and you cut it out with a razor knife, and then press on letters and arrows. And uh, the only problem with this, sorry, wrong direction, is that it also subjected it, me to lots of tricks. <laughs> from the floor crew, because I'd be standing here, I'd be in the chroma key, so I'd be like, the map would be like eight feet tall, not eight and a half by 11. So they lit fire to my maps one day. So after gulping a few times, I had to talk about the heat wave coming. Uh, or if we had something happen like one time, a big fly, landed, a horse fly landed on the map, it was like, I turned around, I was like, ah! You know, this thing was like three feet tall. <laughs> so uh, we had lots of great experiences. And 
So did they, so did they in the early days of television at all the stations, right, Gary? I remember a weather guy who's passed on now, John Digman. He was a character. He used to twirl a 39 Hudson antenna like a baton. And if anybody called him for a forecast like a pilot, he said, God, he said, don't talk to me. I'm, I'm just an entertainer. Call Kelly. You know? <laughs> I don't want you to crash. And, uh, but John once did the weather nude from the waist down on a bet from the floor crew. He's really trusting them, I'll tell you. <laughs> Why? <laughs> if you heard, you heard that story. I had another uh, experience with a meteorologist that uh, uh, thought he was feeling better, but uh, wasn't, and uh, managed to throw up on the air. Throw up on the air. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just looking so he can deny it. Uh, but. Uh, they managed to cut away from the video really fast, but the audio guy couldn't find the control, so <laughs> you heard these horrible noises going on. <laughs> and then the newscasters came back, and they were so hysterically laughing, they could not say another word. They, they finally said, sports will be nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's where we are today. You, I won't play much of this, but we've come a long way. And uh, we're fortunate with Weather Central to have our systems in hundreds of markets, uh, over one billion Chinese watch their weather on our equipment and software every night. Uh, we're in Paris and London and all over Europe, all through Canada, Mexico, South America, Mexico. Uh, so we've had a great run of it. But uh, we started using eventually the same computer system, silicon graphics, that were used for the first version of Jurassic Park and so on, the really high-end animation and graphics. And uh, Dave Erickson here had a lot to do with programming what you're seeing. So, so you're familiar with this from today's weathercast. It's partly flash and dazzle, but it's partly the ability to transfer information that you need more quickly, more accurately, and in more detail. Off of that. Um, we also, uh, in the 1990s, started a company called uh, My Weather LLC, and that was to we had, had invented the ability to do micro weather models. And computer power is, in those days, and even now, it's uh, at least as difficult to model the atmosphere of what's happening over the next 12 hours as it is to model an atomic explosion. It takes the world's biggest computers to do it, and even then you have to wait hours for the output. So we were frustrated because we knew that things that gave you a 20 kilometer resolution, and what I mean by that, I'm talking about grid sizes now, roughly 20 kilometers this way, 20 kilometers that way, if you think of a box, and you do all your analysis in there. Uh, over the years, we invented the ability to do one kilometer resolution well before, I think, uh, pretty much anybody else. And we knit those together, one of, the, one of the amazing software pieces of work that our team did. It doesn't do any good to have a bunch of little one kilometer boxes if everyone looks like a piece in a jigsaw and everyone is different. You have to kind of rationalize between them in such a way to get a, a continuous flow and a, and a proper uh, overall look. But uh, we fortunately overcame that. We were the first commercial weather app when the Apple iPhone came out on the phone. And uh, my son Chris was president of that company and <coughs> took it on to do some really cool stuff over the next 10 years. Uh, but look at, that's a 20 kilometer spacing. There you are at one kilometer. And you can see the incredible detail that you can see on temperatures here. Uh, you can see things like little sea breeze areas here along the coast of California, uh, where the desert heat intrudes, and so on. I'm going to talk briefly about modeling and in particular about wind forecasting a little bit later here as we get into the climate section, but this is just a little teaser. Here again on the left, a lower resolution grid around Salt Lake City. 
for wind speed. And on the right, a much tighter resolution where you can see all of the various wind speeds predicted at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. If you're going to buy a multi-million dollar windmill and you're going to put it on a hill, you better not pick the wrong hill. And uh, everything you make from that wind installation depends on how many miles an hour on the average the wind speed is at your location and uh, uh, lots of other factors involved with meteorology and climatology. We began to test this in places like India that had, uh, has terrible monsoon disasters every year. In this particular case in 2010, this little village on the coast here in a flash flood from a monsoon storm lost 20 lives, nearly 8,000 head of cattle, $32 million in damage. And we were able to show, I don't think it's ever been implemented, uh, but we were able to show that we could forecast individually for these towns, rivers, and stream beds in such a way that there might have been, there probably was, the ability to warn people to move in areas that were going to be affected. All right, part two, I'm a little bit behind, but I'll catch up. Um, I told you I thought there was a lot of progress. There's a little bit of paralysis in states like Wisconsin, but there's a lot of potential for us to make a difference in this room and also in their state. And uh, this, has, this is not a new subject. Uh, Thomas Edison was saying, I sure hope we move to solar energy before we tap all the oil and gas. Wouldn't that have been nice? <coughs> Human nature, as I said in the beginning, our natural tendency is to procrastinate, particularly if business interests are involved who may be making millions of dollars on oil and gas or the infrastructure that's already been put in. It's very hard to get major industries turned around. It's like an ocean liner. Our own Gaylord Nelson also, as, as many in Wisconsin did, understood very well the importance of taking action in the environmental area. Our problem today, or in the last few years anyway, has been, you know, 90, over 90 percent, some say 95, 97 percent of scientific thought is that there is climate change, there is global warming, and it is primarily, if not almost completely, caused by human activities. But uh, the colorization of that is such that you can get lots of scientists who are uh, warning you about the problem, but one of them saying you're cooked in the pot, one saying I'm being boiled in the pot, and the denier says, see, there's no consensus. And that's kind of where we're at in some ways politically today. And then we have a lot of things like this. Uh, certainly we could act like that around here this winter too. Um, with all the meteorologists in the room, by the way, we promise you warmer weather next week. <laughs> <laughs> Easy promise. Can't be worse. And then uh, one quoted by Trump recently, what am I doing? I'm shoveling 36 inches of global warming. People are still confused over local effects versus what's happening to our planet. The Midwest this winter has been as cold or colder than any other part of the, of the world. I talked to somebody in Sitka, Alaska the other day. I said, how's the weather? It's 47 degrees. You know, Siberia's had a mild winter. In, in London, they're wearing shorts. So it's not just that it's cold in Wisconsin that matters. And then again, showing our, my political stripes. Please excuse me if you're on the other side of the aisle, but uh, you know, almost any, any excuse will do. If you're up in the air, you can't be sinking, right? So the good news out of all this is, and this is a 10-year study done by George Mason University and the Center for Climate Change Communication. And they've asked the same questions now for 10 years. And you can see the trend is very, very steady. A lot slower than we wish, 
but just in 2018, we finally crossed 51 percent of people saying they're extremely or very sure that global warming is happening. Meanwhile, the people who think it isn't happening have gone down. It was a fairly low base to start with, but down from 11 to 7. So a lot of other information shows that people are now really urgently asking for change. And this is an interesting <coughs> chart which came out of that same report. Um, a large majority of people, including 95 percent of Democrats, 81 percent of independents, but even 76 percent of those who classify themselves as Republicans believe climate change is happening and they want the governments to take steps to address it. Well, what governments? 83% want the federal government involved, 80% want their state government involved, 76% want their local government or community or village or town want them to be involved too. This is becoming an overwhelming consensus and it's one of the reasons why I actually feel pretty positive. And most of these people are being influenced by the recent extreme weather events. They're finally listening to all the arguments supporting the existence of climate change, their own personal observations, news stories, and the like. So that's good news. Now we've got to do something with it. <coughs> I don't really like uh, business forums, particularly when the billionaires are there in Davos, Switzerland, <laughs> or doing other things. Because most, of, not all of them, but most of them are after preserving the status quo and their own wealth and their own <coughs> way of living. Not interested in upsetting the apple cart so much. But this I found to be quite fascinating. This is very recent from the World Economic Forum in the, uh, toward the end of 2018, beginning of 2019. They were asked uh, to rate What's the biggest risk you see out there to the continuation of the human race? And what is the risk likelihood that that may come true? Well, I'm not arguing with that one. I, I sure hope to God that we never see additional atomic explosions or a war between Kashmir and India or, or North Korea or anything else. But Obviously, if it occurs, it's, it was deemed by this group to be fairly unlikely, but the worst possible thing. You look at everything else, inflation, infectious diseases, food crisis, asset bubbles, cyber attacks, data fraud, all of them are kind of in the middle. What are the ones that are at the top? Failure of climate policies, increased natural disasters, and extreme weather. So here you have some of the richest, biggest business and corporate people in the world who have recognized that this has to be dealt with, that this is a major risk, and they're not doing this out of the goodness of their heart, as, in my opinion, as they are out of the fact that if they don't do something about it or encourage things to be done about it, it will affect their business badly. We're already seeing, uh, I think you all know about the temperature trend, which is on the next graph, but, uh, you know, and we've, we've known for a while that the, sorry, I keep pushing the wrong button there, but uh, we've, we've known that the shallower ocean is warming quite rapidly, but now they're determining that the deeper ocean is also beginning to warm quite substantially, particularly since 1980. And uh, this is really, a tough thing because we rely on ocean temperatures for lots of very delicate plant and animal life and for keeping uh, frozen methane beds down where they're frozen and lots of other reasons that I don't have time to get into. But uh, you, this, of course, you've seen many times. And uh, again, it talks to our procrastination. If we could have done something back in here, or even here when we're first seeing the effects, we'd have a lot less urgency and emergency than we have now. But here we are. What progress has been made? And I, again, on the optimistic front, 
There is now a U.S. Climate Alliance of 19 states since the election in 2000, and just uh, last year, Michigan, Illinois, and New Mexico have joined. And, late news, even too late for my PowerPoint, but a week or two ago, uh, Tony Evers said Wisconsin will join this alliance. That's a great thing. Uh, and we cover now more than half of U.S. population with this alliance. The focus will be on rapid wind solar uh, implementation and the development of electronic vehicles and or electric vehicles and the charging support and the other infrastructure needed. Some of these states have set extremely high goals. California's goal in 2030, just 10 years from now, 11, is 50 percent plus. And California and Hawaii have said they want to be completely renewable, no fossil fuels whatsoever by 2045. Um, I'm going to take a, a moment for a little technical explanation. Maybe you all know this, but there, people get confused between carbon cap and carbon tax, both of which are, can be potentially big players in helping us. Uh, the, the cap and trade. Uh, if you issue permits to pollutants, polluters, like power utilities, you say, okay, you're allowed to pollute this year X million tons of carbon dioxide. But uh, the total permits decline every year. Um, you can trade them between companies. So if one company gets ahead of another, they can say, yeah, I got some extra permits. You want to buy them? Think of a big game of musical chairs. you are always taking a chair away, and the last guy has no place to sit. Uh, this is kind of like that. And we already have some states, nine northeastern states and California, have adopted this cap and trade, and uh, they're gradually reducing the amount of carbon permits each year. New Jersey, Virginia, Rhode Island are talking about joining this alliance. Now, carbon tax in some ways is easier, uh, and either one would work. A carbon tax, just like it says, you emit carbon, you pay a tax. You emit 10 times the amount of carbon, you pay 10 times the tax. The tax starts off really, really small, but if you don't do something about your carbon, the tax each year grows bigger and bigger and bigger until it becomes overwhelmingly high. And uh, it works. British Columbia adopted this a number of years ago as the most successful system in the world right now. It has had a major effect in forcing declines of carbon emissions. Uh, there are quite a few states, and the revenues raised by this tax, this is a point of lots of disagreement, healthy disagreement. Some people want anything raised by the tax to go right back to the taxpayers as a tax credit. They're afraid if it comes into the state, the state will spend it on God knows what. Uh, so they want it all back because they're going to have to pay a few bucks more on their utility bills because the utilities, for instance, are reducing their carbon, they're adding new equipment, they're doing other kinds of things. Uh, so there's supposed to be an offset, which is a zero. The other way of doing it, which Massachusetts and uh, Rhode Island are thinking about, is they take some, they re rebate most of it. What is most of it? 70, 80 percent is the numbers I've heard. And they keep 10 or 20 percent, but it's earmarked where it can't be touched by the state for anything but the development of renewable energy sources, electric buses, um, <coughs> electric rail, uh, hydroelectric power, things like that. So there are several ways to go about it. Where do the emissions come from of carbon? And this is a, I got interested in this because I kind of knew the first two answers. Um, a third from electricity generation. The biggest thing we can do, and we're on the way to doing it, is eliminate coal, um, add more renewables, and also nuclear, which I, I used to think I would never support the construction of another nuclear plant, but there's actually 
several companies now with amazing new technology, which is much, much safer, supposedly fail-safe, but you never want to say that, much smaller, much less costly to develop, and nuclear is not a carbon-emitting uh, power source. So in the interim, say the next 30, 50 years, if we had more nuclear plants, we'd be in a lot better shape today. <coughs> I think it's a difficult decision uh, from a social perspective, what we do. A third of emissions come from vehicles, and most of the answers that we hear about are electric cars and trucks. Again, I didn't mean to push that. But, um, Audi and BMW, for instance, are going 100% electric on all their vehicles within three or four years. Audi is introducing a full-size SUV that gets 330 miles on a charge called the Audi e-tron. It's already for sale. Um, there are lots of hybrids, of course. Uh, the Prius was one of the earliest examples. It does make an all-electric vehicle, but there's a lot more coming, not just Tesla. Tesla's going to be hard-pressed to keep up but I'm glad they're there. But, as somebody quickly will point out from this audience, moving to electricity to charge cars only eliminates about half of the carbon pollution because you still have to burn energy, unless you're burning <coughs> nuclear, but natural gas or whatever in order to produce the electricity to charge the cars. But electric cars will get us about halfway there. for eliminating that. Uh, the other third is where I became really interested, and, and almost half of the other third is cow burps. Uh, I used to think it was cow farts, but it's actually cow burps. Um, <laughs> there he goes, mm -hmm. that's another fact check. Um, but cows have four stomachs. The first one called a rumen, when they eat all this grass and stuff, or feed, uh, does the initial digestion. And in that digestion process, one of the byproducts that the rumen produces is methane, which is 18 times worse than carbon dioxide. If I get the right number, anybody know? In that range. Um, so it's a terrible pollutant, and it's a huge problem. It's not only coming from cows, but it's coming from emissions from oil uh, particularly natural gas, where they just kind of flare it off or let it go, things like that. Um, what can you do about the cow burps? Well, there's a Canadian company that has developed a nitrate, I couldn't possibly remember the whole chemical name, which is inert, can be mixed with the cow feed, uh, has no chemical or GMP type implications but reduces the production of methane in the rumen by more than 50%. The cow making methane in its rumen takes up some of its energy, and therefore it takes more feed to grow a cow to a certain weight if it's producing and emitting all this methane. If you cut down on the methane, they found that the cows actually grow on the same food, they grow three to five percent, more weight, faster, healthier, all the rest. So the U.S. Department of Agriculture is looking at this, and uh, so there are answers to these kinds of problems. I, I use that as an example. There are hundreds out there. To, to quote George H.W. Bush, there's a thousand points of light. I mean, there really are a lot of good things going on, most of which we're not necessarily aware of. So we've got to get down 26% in, in order to meet the Paris Accords. You might think that's impossible given where we're at today, but at least we've made substantial progress on coal. <coughs> this is from the Energy Department, the last 11 years of coal <laughs> usage. Uh, start off at 750 million tons. This year will be probably just a share, maybe 380 million tons. So just about cut coal usage in half. <coughs> now, should we go faster? Should we get it to zero? Of course. But, you know, I'm trying to show you the positives of what actually is happening here. 
Now I'm going to show you a few of our competitive states, starting off with the whole United States uh, in terms of what's happening. And this is the, from the Georgetown Climate Center. Coal, as you saw in the previous graph, usage has gone from 51 percent to 30 percent, mostly replaced by natural gas, 17 to 32, nuclear holding about steady, hydroelectric at 7 percent, and a little smidgen of wind now, 6 percent, maybe 1 percent solar. Let's look at uh, a few of our surrounding states. Uh, this is Minnesota. They've cut their coal aggressively. Their nuclear is about the same. Look at their progress on wind because their governor, their legislature, their citizens are very much behind renewable energy development. And so they've increased from practically nothing to nearly 20 percent of their power now being provided by wind. And one other quick vignette. We were small investors in a small wind farm in southwestern Minnesota, hilly country, windy country. Put up five turbines from Siemens, the big tall things. Each could produce 1.2 megawatts. We had a power takeoff agreement to XL Energy in the Twin Cities. These have about reached their overhaul life. They have to all be taken down, completely redone, all that. T turns out, instead of doing that, what they're looking at is scrapping them all and putting up one new turbine, and the new technology will get six megawatts out of that one turbine. <coughs> so wind energy now has fallen below the cost of traditional fossil fuel energy. Solar is right there. So we should be right at the beginning of a boom. Iowa has done the best job in the Midwest. The Hawkeyes are way out of us. Look at their wind. They, they've adopted wind as their, one of their state things. They have 10,000 jobs that have come to the state to help with their wind production and <coughs> fabrication. Uh, and they've done a great, great job. And so instead of using a lot more natural gas to reduce their coal by half, they've added a huge amount of wind power. I wish that were us. Michigan, uh, not so good. They've made some progress in that natural gas emits less, uh, as we said, than coal, but not a lot. California is the poster child. Uh, they never used more than a trickle of coal. Um, way back here, it's zero now. And meanwhile, biomass is at 5 percent. Uh, solar is at 16 percent biggest in the country. They expect that to be 30 percent within five years. Wind, uh, hydroelectric is 20 percent, and wind is coming up. So except for the natural gas, there are already a majority of their power is generated by renewable sources. We'll skip Oregon because I'm running short on time. The overall story for the whole United States is coal use is declining, <coughs> hydroelectric is increasing, a little bit more nuclear, particularly in the Carolinas, more natural gas, which helps halfway anyway, uh, but a long way to go. The paralysis areas are places like Illinois, uh, where they're heavily dependent on nuclear. They haven't changed their coal that much. They don't have much in the way of renewables. 7 percent wind, better than we have, but not very good. And unfortunately, Wisconsin. Wisconsin's down 15 points on coal over 11 years, but it's all been taken up by more natural gas, being a fossil fuel too. And you can see that our bits of renewable, a little bit of hydroelectric up north in particular, a tiny bit of wind, and uh, we're basically at the starting line. Matter of fact, if you look at the official published goals, now this is not Tony Evers' goal. This was Walker's goal. Tony hasn't set one yet, but we were about the worst in the country uh, in terms of percentage of renewable energy over the next 10 years. And that can't stay. Potential in the future? How do we change things? There are four or five 
major indicators, according to Georgetown Climate Center. One of them is high you doing with your utilities in terms of making partners out of them. I happen to, to know, just by coincidence, the retired CEOs of Alliant Energy, Madison Gas and Electric, and We Energies. Between the three, they produced a good majority of the power in the state. All three of them say, we didn't have to be at 10%, that's where they are now. We could have easily been at 20 or 25% renewable. But we were told <coughs> if we did that, governor's office wouldn't permit that, the PSCs would be all over us, the rate paying base would, we wouldn't have any support. So we, we're a public utility, we can't do this on our own. We need guidance, we need standards, we need the insistence that we get to that, and we can get to that quickly. But we haven't done it. This is the track we're on. We've done a little bit better. Here's 2018. Our current trend is pretty flat. <coughs> Where do we need to be? This is the U.S. Paris Pledge for 2025 and our stated goal for 2050. People might say, we give up. But look at this. If we did one thing, adopted an economy-wide carbon tax the same as what British Columbia has been very successful with, we could almost reach the Paris goals with that one implemented thing. 